Mr. Rand. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, I want to talk about uh, evaluation of another variety of language. So you should. Um, a lot of media and social attention has been paid over the years to uh, the observation that children of minority ethnic backgrounds, especially black and Latino children, on average tend to underperform in American schools. There's been a lot of public discussion and academic research on this uh, issue, uh, and a broader range of policies, programs, remedial education initiatives, and so on that seek to address it. Now, obviously, there's a lot of things that contribute to this outcome, uh, ranging from residential segregation and underfunding of schools to outright racism. But linguistic prejudice, which is the topic of this uh, forum tonight, is clearly a major contributor and one that has gotten little notice uh, uh, or no attention at all. Schools, standardized chest, tests, and educational systems in general are among the foremost advocates and guardians of the standard language myth that Laurel was talking about earlier. Students are constantly perceived, uh, evaluated, judged, and graded on the basis of their language. And the ruler that they are compared to uh, is the so-called standard language. Kids whose speech and writing do not conform to this variety are marked down. They get poorer grades, they get tracked into less challenging <coughs> programs and subjects, they're considered to be less bright or academically capable. Now, there are many teachers <coughs> excuse me, um, who are aware of this kind of uh, linguistic prejudice and can see past the differences in language to the student's actual intelligence and creativity, even if it is expressed differently. But even if the teacher approaches the child this way, the larger educational institutions do not. The standards of evaluation imposed by school systems and standardized tests overwhelmingly converge on requirements that the student must produce uh, the standard language variety. Failure to speak and write correctly is taken as a personal failure. The kid just doesn't have the initiative or the commitment or the intellect to master the subject. So let's consider what this means in social terms. The most basic observation of linguistic science is that every human being achieves perfect mastery of the language that they hear spoken to them in childhood by their parents and peers and family and their neighborhood. If they're exposed to two or more languages, they learn them all. This is a human talent that we all share. This is what it means to be a native speaker. Everybody is going to grow up talking like the people that they talk to in childhood. So <clears throat> this means that every child is going to come to school speaking the way their families and neighbors speak. If the people they've grown up with speak Spanish, the kid comes to the school speaking Spanish. If the people they've grown up speak standard English, you'll come in speaking standard English. But if your family doesn't speak that, if they speak, say, African American English, then that is what you will speak. And speaking the way your family speaks does not show that you are smart or that you are stupid or that you lack or that you possess uh, the capacity to um, do something good, to succeed in school. It just means that you're a human being. So when children are evaluated and graded on the basis of the way they speak, uh, what is being evaluated is not their particular talents, but their family and their background and their community. Since standardness is defined by the usage of the socially powerful, as Laurel was saying, kids from affluent white families uh, will automatically get good grades on language arts. This is linguistic privilege. But if you come from a community that has been stigmatized and marginalized and has a different way of speaking, you will be judged as academically deficient and consigned literally or figuratively to the back of the classroom. And this is linguistic prejudice. Now rather than just talk about privilege and prejudice in the abstract, I want to put a human face on all this. I want to tell you a story from my own personal experience. I grew up in Philadelphia in a neighborhood which was racially and socially diverse and integrated, and I attended the neighborhood public school for eight years. This is a group of kids from that school, the C.W. Henry School in Philadelphia. My classmates and friends were ethnically diverse, but the majority were African Americans. 
Throughout my childhood, most of the cool kids and popular kids and talented and respected kids among my classmates and friends were black. The varieties of English that the kids came to school speaking were also diverse. I came, came in speaking a white middle class variety that's more or less the privilege standard. The Ecuadorian kids spoke a version of what's been called Latino English. And most of the black kids, not all obviously, but some spoke a variety that has been called uh, African American English. But of course, these are the names that we give to these varieties as adults and as linguists. Uh, but when we were in the schoolyard, they were varieties that simply we associated with individual speakers. So it was the way Greg spoke, or Eduardo spoke, or Daryl. And my best friend in the middle school years was Daryl. He and I played together and did our homework together. We went to museums together. We went to the Franklin Institute, which is the big science museum, where we were thrilled by the planetarium and the human heart exhibit. On my 10th birthday, we went to the Museum of the University of Pennsylvania, where we were blown away by the Egyptian mummies and, mummies and sarcophaguses and the anthropological exhibits. Um, our shared fascination with science and with history was one of the bases of our friendship. Now, among our peer group, Daryl was a verbal superstar. He was quick-witted, eloquent, funny. In the schoolyard, when people started the sounding game, this is a humorous insult game that is common in many African-American communities, Daryl would come up with put-downs that would have everyone howling with laughter. I, on the other hand, was a stone lame at this, so I was fortunate to have Daryl as a friend. Uh, but in the classroom, things were very different. Daryl is black and I'm white. And as we grew older, the social and racial divides of American society began to penetrate our little world. And language was a principal medium by which this occurred. I had the genetic good fortune to be born into a middle class white family, and therefore was a linguistic golden boy to our teachers. Daryl was from a working class black family and had linguistic traits we call African American English. So he was subjected to what, in retrospect, I think of as a form of linguistic child abuse. More than a few of our teachers would torture Daryl and the other black kids in the classroom about their use of African American English characteristics. They targeted his omitted copulas for saying things like, he happy, instead of he's happy. They mocked his negative concord, which uh, Laurel talked about, saying things like, you don't know nothing, instead of you don't know anything. But one thing they particularly nailed him on had to do with pronunciation. Like many black Americans, and like many white speakers from the South, Daryl had a merger of the vowels in pin and pen. He pronounced both of these the same. He said pin and pin. He also says chemical and pencil and sensitive and so on. And we had one teacher who would drill Daryl and the other black kids who talked this way on this pin and pen distinction, and it went something like this. Miss Kelly would say, say pin, and Daryl says pin, and then she says, say pen, and he says pin. She says, no, no, you said it wrong. I said pen and you said pin. Now, linguists have done a lot of work on speech perception, which shows that people hear sounds based on the phonological categories of their native language or dialect. There's a phenomenon known as categorical perception. You don't tend to hear gradual phonetic differences between sounds. Instead, you map what you hear straight into the phonemes of your language. So Daryl had one phony, where Miss Kelly had two. So his experience of this exchange was probably something like the following. She says, say pin, she says, pin, she says, say pin, and he says, pin again, and she says, no, I said pin, and you say pin. <laughs> <laughs> so undergoing this kind of stupid and humiliating exercise day after day, Daryl probably concluded that Miss Kelly was simply a crazy old lady altogether. <laughs> Perhaps with a racial subtext. She's a white lady telling a black boy he was either contrary or stupid. Now, what's the rational person going to do in such circumstances? Daryl's parents, pastor, grandparents, brothers and sisters, all the people that he loved and respected spoke the way he did. So is he going to take the word of Miss Kelly about how to talk? Probably not. As a normal, well-adjusted human being, uh, he more likely concludes that school is not for him, the system just doesn't like him. And the long-term implications of the school playing linguistic favorites like this were also pernicious. In the eighth grade, a sorting took place as students were tracked towards different high schools. 
As a good student with what the school lab labeled good language, I was selected for the academic high school and I ended up a university professor. But Daryl had a different outcome. He was as smart and articulate and fascinated by science as I was. He helped me solve homework problems as much as I helped him, but he spoke differently. And he was shuffled off to a vocational high school and ended up becoming a car mechanic. This was white privilege, sustained by institutional linguistic privilege, clear and ugly. Now one thing about this process that is particularly destructive is that it pretends to be an unbiased assessment of your ability to master a subject. Every kid comes to school not knowing math and science and history, and so they start their studies of those subjects from the same point. But language is different. I came to school already speaking the standard, not through any creative ability of my own, but because that's what my parents spoke. So I had a huge head start over the black and Latino kids who spoke the way their parents spoke, which was not the standard. One pernicious aspect of the standard language myth is that it is portrayed as just another set of knowledge that everyone must be acquire and that it's socially neutral in the same way that science or math do not favor one ethnic group over another. So my African-American English speaking uh, classmates were told that they were getting the short end of the stick, not because the system was built to favor speakers like me, but because they were personally inadequate. Back then when I was a child, it was clear to all of us kids that this shit was wrong. <laughs> but at that age, we were powerless to do anything about it, and we didn't even have the words to articulate what was wrong. As adults, we have the ability and the obligation to understand how this is wrong and to do something about it. As a linguist, I can bring my professional expertise and scientific evidence to bear on the issue, to name linguistic prejudice for what it is, and to speak out against what happened to Daryl then and continues to happen to children from linguistic minorities today. The variety that I and my family speak the so-called standard is not an intrinsically superior or beautiful or logical or expressive <coughs> language. And it's not just another school subject. Rather, it's a language variety like any other whose standardness comes from the social power of its native speakers. Discrimination against those who happen not to speak it natively is prejudice, plain and simple. <laughs>